Um, so let's talk a little bit about the reflex lab. Um, and then I also realized we never did the literature search stuff. So um, this week during lab, we're also going to introduce the idea of the scientific literature and um, assign the literature search, literature search homework. Um, so, but yeah, this week lab is going to be reflexes and literature search. So here we go. So it all kind of starts with this idea of a reflex arc. Which is an idea you've been introduced to already in lecture when we were describing the overall structure of the nervous system. Basic idea of the reflex arc is there is some stimulus, you know, which ultimately has to be detected by the sensory division of your nervous system. Then there's some integration. Integration means kind of figuring out what to do. Um, this is usually either the brain or the spinal cord. And then there's some response. You know, again, the response is gonna, what are the, what are the things that are operated by the efferent or motor division? Muscles. Yeah, there's muscles. Muscles, what's another thing you can activate? Glands. Glands. So this is a basic reflex arc, you know, arc because it's an arc. You know, it's like, woo, arc. And it starts with a stimulus, there's some integration, there's some response. Um, some are called innate, meaning they're just built into your nervous system, right? If you know, things that are innate are like the withdrawal reflex. If there's pain, you pull away from the pain. Um, the stretch reflex, which we're gonna be looking at, like if a muscle gets stretched out, it tightens up a bit. You know, this is kind of helping you not fall over. If you're starting to like list over to one side and the muscles are elongating, there's an automatic thing pulling them tight to, to kind of keep you standing straight. Innate reflexes, um, you shine a light in somebody's eyes and their pupil constricts. You know, that's not something you learn. That's something that's just pre-wired into your nervous system. Um, these are really useful in, you know, a clinical setting because it's a way to test if your nervous system is working properly. You know, you know what the appropriate response should be for a particular stimulus if the system is working. So a neurological exam usually goes through a number of these innate reflexes and makes sure they're working properly. That's a lot of what today's lab is about, or this week's lab, I should say, is about, is give, getting you familiar with some of these innate reflexes that are typically tested during neurological exams. Um, <clears throat> there are also learned reflexes learned also called conditioned. Or I should say versus. You know, this cla the classic example that everybody knows here is like Pavlov's dog, right? Like if you normally ring a bell, a dog is not gonna salivate. But if you put a big hunk of meat in front of him, he will salivate. But if you start pairing the bell and the meat and the bell and the meat and the bell and the meat and the bell and the meat. Eventually he just hears the bell and he starts salivating. You know, that's a learned reflex and conditioned reflex. You know, when you're driving, you know, if the brake light goes on in front of you, you're automatically gonna kick down on the brake to stop your own car so you don't rear end somebody. But that was something that you kind of learned as you were learning how to drive. It's not like hardwired into your system. You see red lights, tail lights, you hit your brake. 
But now that's kind of, you don't even think about it. It's not like, oh, they are breaking. I better break as well, or else I will rear end them. You just see their lights and all of a sudden you're down. So, you know, so this innate reflex, hardwired, again, like shine a light in your eye, your pupils constrict. You don't have any control over that. But learned reflexes are things that get wired through experience. Um, so that's one way to distinguish reflexes, innate versus learned or conditioned. Another way to distinguish reflexes is where they are integrated, where the integration happens. Like we said, it's usually brain and spinal cord. Um, there are a number of reflexes that are integrated fully within the spinal cord. They're called spinal reflexes. So like when I was talking about um, the pain, when you withdraw from pain, that's just in the spinal cord. You don't need the brain. When you have the, that knee jerk reflex, that patellar tendon reflex, we're gonna look at the classic thing where you whack on someone's knee and they kick out, that is integrated in the spinal cord. It doesn't need the brain. Um, the reflexes we'll talk about later where you need to urinate or defecate as your bladder or rectum starts stretching out and you got that urge to pee or to poop. That's integrated in the spinal cord, not in, you don't need the brain for that. You know, at the same time, there are a number of reflexes that do need the brain. Those are called cranial reflexes. Um, for instance, when we look at the pupillary reflex later this week, where you shine a light in somebody's eye and their pupil constricts, that is integrated in the brain. So, Spinal reflexes integrated in the spinal cord, cranial reflexes integrated in the brain. Um, so that's kind of like the background of reflexes that you need to know for, for, um, for this. What else? We got go some more terminology. Back, ipsy lateral versus contralateral. So ipsy lateral means the same side. Contralateral means the opposite side. So this is usually um, used when we're talking about the response to some stimulus, right? If you um, whack on somebody, you know, in fact, we're gonna be doing the knee jerk response, right? Where you like whack on their knee with a little hammer and they kick out. You know, the leg that kicks out is the same leg that you hit with the hammer that would be an ipsilateral response. The response is on the same side of the body as the stimulus happened. Um, withdrawal reflexes are the same. If you um, are walking along, let me, and you step on a tack, Ouch. You are going to withdraw. You're going to pull up that leg, the same leg that had the pain, right? The withdrawal reflex is an ipsilateral response. The limb that withdraws from the pain is the same side as where the pain happens. Um, at the same time, there's another, another um, reflex that we are not going to look at in much detail. Um, for instance, this something called a crossed extensor reflex. Crossed extensor reflex 
is actually you extend the limb on the other side, on the opposite side of your body. So here we have this withdrawal reflex, which is ipsilateral. The, the limb, the leg that stepped on the tack is pulling away from the pain. But the opposite leg on the other side is extending. Now, why would that be a useful thing? Why is this a good thing to wire hardwire into a into a person? Having this contralateral extensor response. It allows you to bring your other leg up and like like be stable. Yeah, exactly. It keeps you from falling over, right? If you yanked one leg up, but the other leg didn't like compensate, you would topple. You know, that might even be worse than just pulling away from the pain because you're going to fall down into the bed of coals or whatever. Um, you know, so just giving you a sense. Ipsilateral response, the response is on the same side as the stimulus. Contralateral response, the response is on the opposite side from the stimulus. Um, sometimes we also talk about a consensual response. Consensual response is if there is an ipsilateral response, but then also a contralateral response as well. So we're going to see some of this as we go on in this, in this lab. Sometimes you can have a response that's ipsilateral on the same side, but you also have a contralateral response. This is... Kind of running out of space down there, but you've got my words. So contralateral response in addition to the ipsilateral response, we call it a consensual response. So that's another word we'll be using as we continue on in this lab. All right, ipsilateral, contralateral, um, and those are good words just in general, right? Um, we use them for all sorts of things. All right, what else do we need to do here? Okay. I'm gonna describe now the stretch reflex. Um, I wonder, it might even be better just to kind of show you the little video that I had made for you to actually see um, when you were supposed to actually figure out your, um, your, pre-labs. So maybe I'll just do that because this way I can actually, um, you can see me with the big leg model and stuff, which I can't actually do here with Zoom and my little iPad. So I'm going to, I'm going to hand over the screen to myself a few months ago in lab. So you can actually see me describing the stretch reflex that we're going to be looking at for the first part of today's lab. a little bit about stretch reflexes, which we're going to be looking at in our lab today. And the stretch reflexes are reflexes that in a, a normal, any kind of reflex part, is going to be some stimulus going to some integration, some response, arc. In the case of this stretch reflex, the stimulus is going to be the stretch of a skeletal muscle. And that's detected by this little receptor called the muscle spindle. It basically detects if the muscle is stretching. 
the integration is going to be happening in the spinal cord for these stretch reflexes. So doesn't that involve the brain and all of the integration is happening? It's still CNS, but spinal cord. So this is what we'd call a spinal reflex. And the response is going to be a message coming out of somatic motor neuron leaving the CNS and triggering contraction of the muscle. And the basic um, stretch reflex is muscle stretches. Sends a message in that the muscle has stretched. There's a single synapse. synapse. This is what we call a monosynaptic reflex. There's only one synapse involved with it. Sends a message back and it tightens up the muscle that kind of pulls it back in. These are useful just for like posture. Like you're starting to lean one way, there's an automatic pull to um, tighten up the muscle that's starting to stretch out there. Um, and this is a really common reflex that is tested during a neurological exam to make sure the nervous system is working well. Um, you just need to stretch a muscle and see if the response is an automatic tightening. Now, stretching the muscle is usually accomplished with like your little reflex hammer. And for instance, I've drawn the leg here. This is like your thigh, this is your shin. Um, and this is your quadriceps group. This is like vastus lateralis and medius medialis and um, rectus femoris. They all yank on this tibial tuberosity here on your top of your tibia, top of your shin bone. And there is this tendon and then ligament that attaches here. And when you use the hammer, Push in on there. It's basically pulling on the muscle. I take my model here of the leg. And these are the thigh muscles, the quadriceps, and the kneecap, which is actually embedded within that patellar tendon. And then this little place here, this is where you actually hit with your little hammer. And as you hit with your little hammer, it's like right below the kneecap and above the tibial tuberosity, the little attachment point on the shin bone, you can actually feel it. You can actually just push in. You'll feel this kind of springiness in there to find just that right spot. And you give a little whack with your hammer. That ultimately is pulling on the whole muscle, which sends the stimulus in the spinal cord, sends the response out. And if it all goes well, Ooh, the leg should kick out. Um, you can see a similar thing with the calf muscles, the triceps sort of. This is the gastric medius and soleus muscles, which all insert here on your heel bone, on the calcaneus. Um, here you can hit the little calcaneal tendon, Achilles tendon, with the hammer, which is going to stretch out your calf muscles. And it's the same kind of response. So these will tighten up, pull up on your heel, and point your toes, which we call plantar flexion. So these are two um, stretch reflexes that we're going to specifically be looking at in our lab. We'll look at them both under normal conditions as well as under what we call a gymnastics maneuver, which is basically your subject kind of interlocks their fingers and pulls really hard and keeps pulling. And they keep this position and now you can do the same reflex again as they continue to pull and see if and how it affects their the magnitude, how strong the reflex is. So that this is gonna be, I've kind of basically laid out the independent and dependent variables um, right there for this first part of the lab that we're gonna be doing. Right, that gymnastics maneuver, that holding and pulling, that is our independent variable. Whether or not they are doing gymnastics maneuver is going to be this independent variable, the thing that we change. Let's do the reflex with it. Let's do the reflex without it. And then the response or the, um, the dependent variable that we're looking at is the magnitude of the reflex. How strong is the response of the reflex? in these different conditions, right? So, and again, we're gonna be looking at the stretch reflex with the um, patellar tendon, which is the, the thigh muscle. And then we're also gonna be doing the same thing, looking, you know, varying gymnastics maneuver while looking at the 
um, plantar reflex, the one with the calf muscle. So just kind of giving you a sense of what the whole point of, you know, part one of the reflex lab is. We've got our independent variable, which is gymnastics maneuver or not, and then the dependent variable, which is the magnitude of this stretch reflex under the different conditions. Um, we're going to be looking at the magnitude for the calcaneal reflex just in a more qualitative way. Just how big was it when they weren't doing this? How big was it when they were doing this? For the patellar tendon reflex, we are going to do a little more formal quantitative measurement of how big is the response. And we can do that. That's kind of drawn up for you. So again, you've got a, this is your thigh, this is your leg, your calf when it's just you know, hanging loose. And then you, you know, whack them below their kneecap, they kick out a certain amount. And we want to kind of normalize, you know, a tall person is going to have a larger swing, a shorter person will have a shorter swing, but we want to normalize that it doesn't matter how long their leg is. So we're going to measure the magnitude of the reflex by the angle that the leg um, swung out from hanging vertical. Um, and then we can actually figure this out pretty easy using trigonometry. Um, which is basically relationships between angles and sides of a triangle. So we're going to have your subject is going to be sitting down with their leg hanging and a little bit off the ground so they can swim freely. We're going to take a stick and tape it onto their leg. So now as their leg swings, the stick will also swing out. We will have a ruler on the floor. So as you know, kind of zero is when their leg is hanging vertically. A is what is the distance at the maximum extent when they're kicking out. Um, we're also going to measure this distance B, which is the distance from this pivot point where their knee is actually bending here to the floor where the ruler is. So if we have this length B, which you just measure from your subject's pivot of their knee to the floor where the ruler is, you measure this A, which is the extent that they kicked out during the reflex. And then you just have a little formula. This is arctan or inverse tangent of A divided by B. And that will, just by definition of arctan, give you this angle. Um, when you are doing this on your calculator, you want to really make sure that you set your calculator mode to be in degrees. So mode has to be degrees. You know, 90 degrees is a right angle. 180 degrees is like a flat, you know, fully horizontal. 360 degrees in a circle. Um, a lot of calculators um, are going to be you don't know what they're, they might be in radians. Radians, you have two pi radians in a circle. That's not going to be a very different number. So make sure you are in degrees when you're setting up the mode of your calculator. So when you interpret your angle, it, it makes sense. Right. Yeah, so, and if you've taken, like kind of higher math classes, you know, right? And radians of what you do all your kind of angles in and as you get into, into regular math classes. But again, two pi radians in a circle, that's like six point, like, you know, like less than six and a half versus 360 degrees in a circle. So if you don't have your calculator set to the right mode, you'll get really weird results for this. Um, so, you know, for this first part of the lab, like I said, there's going to be an actual independent and dependent variable objective. The rest of the lab, the part two of today's, of, of this week's lab are more demos. They're going to be 
kind of getting to know a lot of different reflexes that are commonly used in exams. But this first part, part one, actually does require an objective and a hypothesis. Um, so let me go and share screen again. You know, here on this page here, which was introduction to the reflex lab, there's a little web page describing Jindrasik's maneuver. It's just like a, you know, just a few paragraphs. So you can get a sense of what it is. So you're trying to remember, like, what is Jindrasik's again? Again, here's a little description of it. Again, having your, your hands, you know, and exactly how it works, depending on what you read, there are kind of some different, um, different hypotheses. Um, it's clear that in general, it tends to what we call facilitate, increase the magnitude. Um, kind of the most intuitive thing for me is, maybe I can, you know, if you, let me go back here. Right, you've got your brain and your spinal cord. You've got like some signals coming in, synapsing here. Yeah, so in order to have a response, this neuron has to go, has to go above threshold, right? In order to have, right, we, we've talked a bunch now about what actually makes some action potential happen. It's when that neuron gets above minus 55 millivolts and triggers an action potential. So at some level, we're not gonna have a response unless this motor neuron gets above its threshold. So then you think about Gendrasic's maneuver. Somebody's sitting there going, ur, ur. maybe not. And actually, the fact is actually people in powerlifting, people actually can lift heavier weights when they do, when they grunt and go, ur. Um, there's a lot of activity. If you're doing this, there's all sorts of motor activity, motor activity coming out to your muscles, all sorts of sensory activity coming in from the receptors that you're feeling everything getting pulled. So there's a whole lot of activity in the spinal cord before anything is happening. There's kind of this elevated level of activity when you're doing Gendrasic's maneuver. You know, and now you're gonna do your reflex and the same stimulus coming in is very likely going to have a stronger response coming out. More neurons are probably close to their threshold than they were before because we have all this pre-excitation already going on, right? Um, you know, I, you know, like if I, you know, if I walked up behind you and tapped you on the shoulder, you know, normally I can do this if we're in the classroom, but we can't. But if I was like walked up behind you and tapped you on the shoulder, you go, huh, what's up? Right. But if you were in some horror movie where half of the class had already been murdered by some chainsaw, like, you know, crazy. And you're like, oh, you're, everything's already elevated. And then you feel a tap on your shoulder, you're gonna go, Wah! right? Right. The same stimulus can have a really different response if everything's already in this kind of pre-excited state. You know, that's, when I think of gendrastics, I kind of think of it a little more like that. You know, at, at the same time, there are other hypotheses or it could be a number of things going on um, exactly why it works, you know, from everything being pre-excited to having a little, you know, kind of being distracted from, from a stimulus. So, you know, read, read this. Let me go back to this thing, share screen. You can read this thing about Gendrasic's maneuver here. Um, again, if you need to review what the knee jerk reflex is. Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience, is where a simplistic app Two minute the knee jerk thing, reflex is a simple reflex where he's going over it again. And what I want you to do is 
actually get, I'm gonna put you into little breakout rooms. I just want, it's, and it's gonna be simple, but I want you to just clearly state what is the objective and what are your hypotheses for this part one of the lab? Um, again, if we go into the um, reflex action PDF, you know, part one facilitation of the you know muscle stretch reflex. You know, there's one A. And there is one B. One B is the Achilles tendon, the one where you hit on the right above the heel. One A is the patellar tendon reflex where you're hitting below the kneecap. You know, you can just have kind of one basic objective and hypothesis because those are just two examples of the same thing, looking at facilitation of a stretch reflex. So what you should do in your lab notebook is write down what is the objective, and it is actually, it's kind of written there, but write it in your own words and make sure you understand what you're talking about. And then write your hypotheses. Um, and we'll, you know, this shouldn't take too long. We'll do this and we'll give you like 15 minutes to just kind of get together and do this. And then in 15 minutes, we'll come back and we'll actually kind of look at what happens. We'll have some videos of what it actually looks like. Um, and if you want to, you can also kind of have some fun and even try to make the, have the reflex happen on your own body. Um, you don't need a hammer. You can just use a karate chop even. Um, it's easier to do on somebody else. So if you have somebody lying around that they don't mind if you whack at them, um, that can be fun where you could, I'd say at some point, at some point before, you know, during the week, even though it's not necessarily going to be part of your data, it's kind of fun to just see how this works. Um, but I am going to put you into the breakout rooms. Is there any questions before we do that? Um, are we submitting it or right now or are we just discussing it and then um, writing it in our lab book? Um, I think we'll just discuss it and then write it in the lab book. Yeah, so right in the line, you'll you'll be submitting it when we do the the main submission for the for the reflex lab, but it doesn't make sense to submit it right now. So okay. that, just but write it down. So write it down. All right, here we go. I'm going to go into breakout rooms. We're going to create, and here we go. And this is your chance to also just decompress, like, oh my God, I'm glad that's over. Um, Juliana, are you there? Juliana? Hey, Siri, 15 minute timer. Okay, 15 minutes and counting.
Oh, people are coming back. Um, and so Grace, what happened with your computer? I have no idea. I have to figure it out. It was something with my internet connection saying it was being intercepted. Um, I The proctorio person was trying to help, but none of her fixes were helping. So. Maybe there's some kind of virus that's diverting your, your stuff or something. That's what I was wondering. Um, I just, I don't know enough about computers, so I have to find someone who can kind of help me decipher that. that was pretty straightforward for most people. Um, anybody want to share? <laughs> I think Tim's cat's butt. <laughs> Sorry about that. He, he likes to show up. No, that's, my, my guys do that a bunch too. Um, all right. So what, what are... What are some of your hypotheses? They should, they should all sound kind of similar. Does anyone want to share a hypothesis? I put that, um, I believe that the use of the gendrastics maneuver will cause the muscles to contract more, creating a stronger reflex due to the heightened excitatory state of the nervous system. Yeah, something like that. That's, it should be something that simple. You know, partly I wanted you to spend time just making sure that you kind of had a sense of what we're doing, what the process is, what we're looking for. How are we going to see, how are we going to measure our dependent variable in the case of the patellar reflex? Anybody? I'm measuring the uh, arc of the leg, how much it swings out. Yeah, we're going to see see how far it swings out, and then we'll have to do the trigonometry to actually figure out the angle there. Is that going to be a qualitative or quantitative um, measurement? Quantitative. So I'm going to sure. say it one more time. Quantitative. Yeah, it'll be quantitative. We're actually going to have numbers. We're going to actually be able to measure what is the angle and see is the angle a bigger number or a smaller number, depending on the conditions. Now, what about for the plantar reflex where you're hitting um, above the heel? How are we going to, how are we going to um, measure the dependent variable there? We're going to use greater than or less than. So yeah. it's going to be qualitative. Yeah, it's going to be more, you're going to eyeball it. It's like, does it seem like it's bigger than it was or less than or about the same? Yeah. Right, qualitative. Like qualitative is where you, you know, comparative, but you don't actually got numbers going on. Right, so, you know, so in both cases, we're going to be looking for the relationship and to see if, if, you know, we're, you have, you know, we're going to have a facilitation of the response, but we have kind of different ways to actually measure our dependent variable. Um, you know, one, one of them obviously is going to be less prone to error, right? If you're just kind of eyeballing it and it's kind of close, it's kind of tricky sometimes to know. But if you're actually got numbers, you can see, you can see for sure. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is just show you what it looks like when you actually do this experiment. Um, and let me go back to sharing. 
again, it's useful also, like, you know, in your, the more you, when you think about sources of variability, you know, those often come from understanding how the actual experiment is done, because you can see where the problems might be in your data. Um, so I'm going to new share. And let's Okay, Reflex Lab, part one, doing it. Right, so this is this is what it looks like. If if you were, and again, I still, you know, I feel I feel you definitely are missing out, not being able to like, you know, whack each other with hammers and stuff. It's fun, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't like try to elicit this on somebody at home just to kind of see how it works and even have them do gendrastics and see if you notice a change. You, might, you don't have to go through the whole rigmarole of measuring things with rulers, but that qualitative um, assessment you can do just by checking it out. So, and again, and you don't need a fancy reflex hammer. You just need, you can even just use a karate chop or something that has kind of a blunt edge that you can whack with. Um, so, you know, have fun, do it at home if you want to just get a sense of it, rather than just watching videos of your teachers doing it, which is, you know, I can say it's more fun to do in person. So here we go. All right, so we have our subject here all set up to take measurements. You can see the leg has the ruler taped onto it. And the ruler extends almost to the ground, but not quite. So obviously, you want it to swing freely. And on the ground, we have a meter stick. And we want to set it up so the stick is measuring right at zero when she's relaxed and her leg is hanging vertically. So I'll double check here. And I'm moving that. So now it's at zero. So as she kicks out, in fact, you can show as your leg kicks out. That angle of the line, you're going to have to kind of approximate where does that line meet the ruler here, and that would be this distance we're calling A. The distance from whatever pivot point to the ground, that's going to be the distance we're calling B. Um, and then obviously you can use those two to calculate the angle. So when you're going to do this, it takes a little while. You can go up and down where her kneecap, where that tibial tuberosity is, and kind of play around, find, oh, that wasn't the right spot exactly. That was the right spot. And so you can see that, and you can, okay, you can put a little piece of tape and make it easier to find again. Obviously, if you go and nothing happens, don't take that data as a zero. And spend a little bit of time so that you can get a consistent response before you actually start getting the data. Um, so we can do this. So right now, my subject is sitting there relaxed. We're going to get kind of our baseline. I should mention, when you're trying to find the spot, um, you palpate. You Basically, there's a springiness. Like you can feel their kneecap. You can feel the tibial tuberosity, the little bump on the top of their tibia. And then there's this kind of springy area where the um, patellar ligament is stretched in between. And you can just, you can, yeah, you'll, you'll feel it. It's this kind of springy area in there. And that's kind of where you hit. And that's what's going to pull and stretch the muscle and cause the reflex to happen. So. Measurement of the magnitude. So I'm getting ready to go. And I'm also taking a look. I'm going to shift my position here so I'll be able to see how this goes out. So you probably don't see me here. Hold on the camera. And go. And we do three. 
So that went out like maybe nine centimeters. That's how to record that. You don't need to record this data. Mm -hmm. yeah. That went out like seven and a half centimeters. And we'll do it one more time. Went out more like 16 Your subject is going to. So, why, why, why am I taking several data points rather than just doing it once and measuring it? You can have an accurate baseline, like a better control to be able to compare the results to. And why does that make it more accurate? You can take the average of them. Yeah. Right. Because yeah, this, again, this is. Going back to this idea of sources of variability, what source of variability am I dealing with here? Hitting the right. Side. Not always. Yeah. I, I I didn't hear. I didn't actually hear that. Said hitting the right spot or not? It's hitting the right spot, and it's even more than that. Even if you hit the right spot, how hard you hit it in the right spot? Is how hard you hit it, and just the same person might have a slightly different response to the exact same, right? It's kind of like with the jumping lab. Even if you do everything just right, the human body has got all sorts of these random things going on that you're probably not gonna have, you know, we're not like some machine where you try to set up everything exactly the same and you respond in the exact same. Otherwise, sports would be boring because everybody could, perform in completely predictable ways and you know what the result's going to be before you start, right? It's like in the moment, someone is doing exactly what they think they're doing at, you know, doing it perfectly and it's still going to have, you know, turn out different one time or another, right? So that's one of the sources of variability is, you know, you know, there's this randomness in how you respond, even if you try to reproduce it just right. And we get around that source of variability by let's take a bunch of measurements and average them and hope we're getting at some you know, true you know, value. But you know, the reason we do the you know, a few times, part of, and like I said, if you hit and you're obviously hit the wrong spot and the leg didn't move much, don't take that data. You know, that would be silly. Um, but if you get a good hit, um, and it's like a perfect hit, it still might not be exactly the same length of kick as when somebody uh, did it the second time with it, also a perfect hit. I'm going to do Gendrasic's maneuver. So you can see she's holding her <laughs> or pulling her um, hands apart, and she's going to hold that tension while we do the reflex. So we're going to do this again. And now she's in Gendrasic's maneuver. Coming in. Wow. So we saw there was definitely a stronger response there. That went out to maybe like 19 or so centimeters. And I'm going to do it one more time. And she's still pulling there. That was probably like 21 centimeters. We'll do one more. That was another 19 centimeters. So there we got our data. We have three readings for the baseline, three readings for the gymnastics maneuver. And we're gonna have to convert those into angles and get the averages and see what happens. So again, you can do this at home and just notice. I think you'll have fun, um, fun doing it. Okay, so we're going to test the gen, or sorry, the Achilles tendon uh, reflex. And so I will uh, aim right here. If you want to try this at home on uh, someone in your family, um, you can use, use your hand, like kind of karate chop, and get a similar reaction. And um, if you want to try a uh, gen drastic, Maneuver. 
So I wasn't sure if that was uh, larger, but maybe. So it's a little hard to see. Um, so, but that's that's the basic um, reflex lab, and right underneath this, where it says reflex lab part one, doing it, it says here. Oh, let me um, share screen. There's this little thing here. It says here is the class data. So, if you're wondering where is the class data, it's right here, right underneath the video. And if you click on that, so in this in this graph here, we already did the calculation to. Um, oh, I know what I. Oh, dag nabbit. It doesn't matter. I remember what I did last time. So this actually just has the um, the data. What I think what I think what I will do is I will email. What what time is it? It's yeah. I will email you some data with some um, with the subject data you know, for one of the subjects with the actual A and B numbers. So you can actually do the calculations. Um, or at this point, maybe not. I'm just thinking. Um, yeah, no, so, so this is just, this is already in degrees. This is the average. So you got some, so you got this, this here because you know plus minus we just use one for plus zero for no change it would have been minus one if it was decreased so here is the data um yeah you can see like my brain like wheels spinning um the reason i'm i'm pausing is i had originally thought of actually giving you measurements and having you like calculate things in your group, but then didn't end up doing that. So yeah, let's just say work, work with the, work just with the degrees. So you use, use these degrees as your data to say whether or not your hypothesis is supported or not. Um, so again, I mean, this first part, part one, is pretty straightforward. There's not a lot, a lot, um, but it is important that you understand the basic idea of what you did and why it's important. And again, gendrastics maneuver would be part of a clinical exam as well. You know, you'd have somebody sit there, hit their knee, and then they'd go like this, and you do it again and see what happens. Again, a big part of these these labs are mostly to kind of give you a kind of a little sampling of what are some of these innate reflexes and how are they used in a clinical way to assess the you know proper functioning of the nervous system. Um, and I should mention that not everybody has a really easy to elicit patellar tendon reflex. Um, every once in a while, I get a student and it's really hard to make the knee kick out. Um, and it's, in fact, I had one student where no matter what I did and no matter how I tried, the person just did not have any patellar reflex. Turns out that their doc you know, knew that that was the case, that there wasn't, you know, it was just one of these anomalous things. This person was actually healthy. There was nothing wrong with them, but just for whatever reason, that particular reflex just did not work the way you normally try to make it happen. So just because somebody's knee doesn't kick out well, like if you're doing this at home 
and you, <laughs> your like kid doesn't kick out right, don't all of a sudden spin out and that they're like got some horrible disease <laughs> or neurological disorder. So I don't want you to like think that, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's a big problem. You know, it would mean something you'd want to like, oh, that's interesting. Actually, let me look, look a little more. But just putting that out there just before you start doing this at home and start freaking out that your kid is, you know, is, is, is not okay. You know, sometimes it's hard to make it happen well. Or also sometimes people just don't relax. Like they get really self-conscious and they just kind of control it and tighten it so it doesn't work. Um, if you're totally relaxed um, and have somebody do it on you because it's if you've never had it done on you it's it's just kind of weird because you're not moving your leg on purpose but your leg's definitely kicking out so it's just so you believe that ref these automatic reflexes actually do happen like even though it is skeletal muscle it is not a voluntary response. It's something that is pre-programmed into your nervous system as an autonomic or as an innate reflex. Um, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, I wanted to keep lab kind of simple. So, cause I know you've already like kind of been through the mill with the exam. So um, on Thursday, we're going to continue looking at reflexes. Um, and again, some of them we'll be able to do at home where you'll be able to look at each other in little Zoom rooms. Some stuff you'll just watch little videos of people doing. Um, but we'll continue on kind of exploring different reflexes. Um, and also, like I mentioned, we will talk about the scientific literature and how you kind of go out and actually see what what do people actually know about different um, topics? What have people actually researched and what have they found? And what are the places you can look where you actually trust what they're saying? You know, a lot of places where you look for information is just total bullshit, right? So it's like, how do you, where do you go and actually trust that there's a good chance that what you're reading isn't just somebody just talking out you know, what it's saying, whatever. There's a lot of stuff, especially on the web, is just people saying whatever. Um, so we'll talk about primary references, secondary references, tertiary references, things like that, and what that means, and how you, you know, how the scientific community kind of polices itself and tries to make sure that people are saying things and drawing responsible conclusions. Um, so. All right, other, I guess that's it. Any comments, questions, or otherwise? All right, so I will yeah, see you all on Thursday.